know, with so many anonymous people in the audience, and particularly among them, um, Arthur McGregor, who was edited in the book on this museum in 1945, and who could give a much abler lecture on the same subject as I. But I will just give you a schoolboy's account of it. And um, we'll start. It's supposed to be untold. We're actually the only surviving uh, cabinet of curiosities intact in its original cases, 18th century cabinet of curiosities, in its original cases, in the British Isles. There are, of course, wonderful ones in continental Europe. Um, now, <coughs> that's a quick, uh, let's see. Whatever. Um, it was made for Newbridge House, my family home in North County Dublin, um, which was built by my ancestor, Archbishop Charles Cobb. He was Archbishop of Dublin. I worked out recently that he had the same income from the Church of Ireland as the Earl of Leicester did from his rental estates. Uh, and indeed, the very first proposal that Gibbs made for the house that he wanted to build was about the size of Hope and Hope. <laughs> Luckily, he didn't build it, and Gibbs produced something rather smaller, that charming villa that you see there. Now, the um, interesting thing is the position of the museum, or the Ark. The two names this room was referred to in the family documents is in the mid 18th century, the Ark and then later in the 19th century, the museum. It was never called a cabinet of curiosity, sadly. I was with sadly, but there we are. But as you see, it's one of the principal rooms. The house not pushed aside. And if you think of company being entertained historically um, in the large drawing room picture gallery, which you see, which is in the bit that the Archbishop's son added during the Archbishop's lifetime to the house, company being entertained there to move in to the dinner in the afternoon, they would not have gone through the hall, which would doubtless have footmen and servants carrying up dishes from the kitchens to the dining room, which you see on the right. They would have gone through the sculpture, and then through the museum, then through the library, and then into the dining room, which was quite an impressive um, uh, idea, I think, that you had all these bits of culture as you approached your meal. Um, things I remember <laughs> um, since the age of four when my mother brought us to live there with my uncle uh, in 1949 and the museum was the room that rarely attracted me partly because it was forbidden and partly because we were taken in there by maids and partly because it was full of wonderful glinting uh, things which looked like treasure, but horrendous things too. This, at the age of four, I thought this was a witch. I don't know why. When you mentioned the word witch, I thought of that. And then this is hardly much better. <laughs> a poisonous rattlesnake in a snake charmer's basket. And the thing I hated most of all, we had sea eagles already in this morning's talk, is a snarling sea eagle on the top of the case which I was quite sure was going to come by and snip you. Um, however, it's really sad to say that though this room survived until 1959, virtually intact but with lots of clutter added into it, there is not a single photograph of the Cameron Curses before 1960, when my mother, when I was 14 at the time, my mother cleared it out and made a very nice sitting room. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so it went on. Well, of course, I was absolutely gutted when I came back from school one weekend to tell that the museum was gone. And I went into the room, and only a few days before, uh, all the cases and their contents had been turfed into the basement of the house and up to the attics as well. And um, the rather wonderful sort of triage of Chinese. Uh, landscape panels that decorated the walls, linked by cut-out bamboo uh, trellises, all cut out and pasted to the wall, like a print room, um, had been sold by my uncle uh, to an Dublin antique dealer. And um, my mother usually managed to stop my uncle selling anything. He often had impulses to sell things, I think, 
uh, that she, she had her eye on the room, so this one she was <laughs> So off went the Chinese paper. But on the floor, I find scraps of the bamboo and chakra paper, so I decided at the age of 14 that, oh dear, oh dear well that will come later. <coughs> but I decided that somehow the room had to be restored. <coughs> And meanwhile, up in the young, where the cases they are in the settlement, um, more of them there. And there are the scraps of bamboo which I picked up off the floor and put in my desk. And it was only 40 years later when it became possible the house was being restored, the uh, family in the form of me had negotiated with Fingal County Council the future for the house, or for a future for the family and the house. The, the Fingal County Council, then Dublin County Council, had bought the park and the house, and they actually asked me would we keep everything in the house and continue to reside in it, as on the lines on British National Trust. And it's the only instance of this ever happening in Ireland, um, it, was a, it, was, it came very late in the day, this proposal. There was an attic sale planned, um, and everything was going to be removed. And six weeks before removal came this request, because there was a misunderstanding on the part of the council. They thought they would get the house in April, they were getting it in December. So they put this at the very last minute thing, and in six weeks I had three meetings a week with the council to work out an arrangement that had absolutely no precedent either in the council or the country. And mm -hmm. the council lawyers were tearing their hair out, but we got that. And so the house was restored um, uh, brilliantly uh, in 12 weeks because it was the sort of budget that wouldn't have lasted a long march. In the middle of all this, uh, time of negotiating, I suddenly thought, the museum, what happened to it? You know, I hadn't thought about it for all those 40 years. And luckily the house was still undisturbed. So I rushed upstairs to the farm nursery, the lumber rooms, um, to see if everything was still there. <coughs> the cases had been lotted by Christie's in Hamilton, um, in Dublin, in one lot for thirty pounds, <laughs> and uh, those were withdrawn from sale. Anything else they put in the sale was withdrawn. And in 1986, the house opened, restored, with the museum restored in position. And my brother and I, my brother-in-law and I, uh, who my brother-in-law was uh, working with me, training with me at the time to be a painter, we painted evocations of the Chinese panels derived from um, the Chinese wallpaper at Irving. And at this particular time, it's a source of great satisfaction to me that Martin Drury, before the restoration, came to, I invited him over to look at the house before the restoration came. And he said, Reddy, you should get the, the council should get the people from Irving there and see, or we should take them to Irving to see what they've done there. Um, which I would like to have done enough, but of course, with this budget problem, things just had to happen. And for instance, we had quarter of an hour to choose all the colours for the grand floor of the house. <laughs> it was fantastic, there were a hundred men working on the house. And it was heroic, actually, on the part of the council. There. And um, I invited Martin back when all was done to see what he thought. And he said, I really think I should get the people from Irving. <laughs> <laughs> so there we are. Now, sadly, or controversially, or perhaps not controversially, after about four years of quite intense public opening, the house shutters with having been, in my childhood, the shutters were closed all the time, permanently. Now they are open every day from nine o'clock in the morning. And then school children started breaking the amazing wobbly 18th century glass, and very wobbly 18th century glass in the cases. I panicked, and also Oliver Impey of the Ashmolean Museum came to stay, and he told me you will need 40 experts to catalogue this museum, because I wanted to catalogue it. There's something like one and a half thousand objects in it. And so I then made a, a 
a difficult decision, but I, one that I knew I had to make, but if I didn't have it with me in England, the catalogue would never get done. So I decided we would replicate the cases on show to the public and put replica junk in them and move the whole museum over to, I was then living in Hatchlands, um, and it was a convenient room which we could put them in, a secluded room which didn't have to be open, it could be kept shuttered as before. And so the museum was installed in that room, and the replica museum uh, sits in Newbridge today with various things that I bought over the preceding years to affect that. And there are two views of the room um, as it stands today in Ireland. Meanwhile, the museum uh, handled in a van across the park in the Hatchlands. And this was a house uh, not familiar to that many people. Right. It belongs to the National Trust. It was left to the National Trust with not a lot of interest. And it had a rather wonderful main room uh, called, it had various names, which was deemed at the time to be rather dull because of the lack of things on display. And I was approached and said, could I turn it up and move our collections into it, which we did. Mm -hmm. I was very keen at that time. I was mad about all the picture hangs in the Palazzi in Rome. And I was very interested in hanging pictures having been built up in a house brimming with them. And so we managed to turn that room into this, um, which now hangs with three or four titians in it and lots of other nice things for the eye. Now, there was one room in Hatton's, which is as dull as the last, um, which was called the Museum. And it had lots of photocopies of naval documents to do with Admiral Boscoe. So it was the Boscoe Museum, this room is called. And it had absolutely not a single artifact, of, apart from, I think, a pulley or a book or something like that. And this was deemed not necessary to open to the public. And so I thought here was the possibility to install the original museum in that. And um, there it is, two views of it. Um, we, I hung it with Chinese, I purchased in 18th century, late 18th century Chinese wallpaper as in memoriam of the original Chinese decorations. And um, the cases fit into it very well. It has more or less the same format as the original room. So that's the history of the museum up to the present day. The next really significant thing that took place for this museum, oh, there's another case, as you see. And everything in this museum, there's natural history, there's Chinese fans, there's shoes, and abundance of shoes. In fact, I've noted, uh, sometime I might do a little publication of how the contents of museums hardly changes from the 16th century to the, to the 18th or even the 19th. They're interested in the same things. You'll see a, you, might, you might see a Chinese compass up there somewhere. Um, but anyway, the next significant thing for the museum that took place happened in Bedford Square in, uh, in the offices of the Paul Mellon Center. And there you'll see a meeting with three people now in the rooms, at least two, Arthur, Brown chairing this meeting, um, and when it was decided that a book would be published about the museum. And this was the first convening of all the potential, some of the potential authors. It was achieved actually with 22 scholars rather than the original 40 that Oliver <laughs> Impey had predicted. And the, the book was sort of born here. And the book was published in September, it had a book launch in Dublin, and there it is. And it's richly illustrated, as you can see from that slide there. So there's a history of the museum. I could stop now if you wanted me to, but I've now got more about family history and objects in it. In which case, we go just to remind you of what it looks like. If you look, in the far right corner, to the right of the fireplace, you see a little mahogany chest. Uh, that is, that uh, debate about whether it's Irish or English, the dice seems to be falling on the English side now. Uh, it's sort of 1740s. So happens that Charles Cobb, having been become Archbishop of Dublin, 
he spent a year in London. He could travel around if he were credit in those days. <laughs> Mostly, I think, worried about his next uh, advancement in the church, which would be to be, to be the privacy of Armagh. It went against him in the end. But he did spend 43 and 44, a lot of the time in London. His favourite child, a stepson actually, had married um, Sir John Percival's daughter, and they lived in London, he went to stay with him several times, and he met John Percival, and probably met John Gibbs, at that, uh, James Gibbs at that time. So there is his collective cabinet, and in it, uh, and here is just something from his accounts. The museum has very, left very little footprint in the archive. The archive is reasonably <coughs> well preserved, but there's very little footprint from the museum. But you see here that he's inherited from his sister a large goat stone in a purse <coughs> and a small ivory egg. <coughs> so he obviously possessed some curiosities. But what we do know, and he commissioned a set, or bought a set of uh, dust rare, dust rare medals of the monarchs of England. There's a famously wonderful set of these in the British Museum, which I've never seen in Gilded. Um, the, he also collected relics of Swift. Um, he was Swift, the dean, the, the Cobb was dean of Christchurch when dean was, Swift was dean of St. Patrick's. Two cathedrals, 500 yards apart. I've never quite understood why Dublin has two ancient cathedrals <laughs> 500 yards apart, and two deaneries 500 yards apart. Whether they got on or knew each other, they must have sat in endless committees together. But he collected copies of Swiss poems which correlate with no other text of those poems. Um, so um, he had special copies from either Swift himself or Swift's secretary with whom he obviously had relations. He also purchased things, knives, etc., at the sale of Dean Swift's effects in 1746. And these silver knives that survived in the museum rather than in the kitchen um, are presumed to be those knives that we see um, purchased with Swifts. There are other relics that he had as well. And we now come to his son. Now, his son got married in 1755 to Lady of Beresford, and he gave Newbridge lots of power to his son on his wedding. States, marriage settlement, everything. So the son got, I think, 30,000 acres, a house, an allowance of 1,200 a year, and 18,000 pounds in money. <laughs> so he had, he had plenty of cash. And we see that in the 1750s, he and his wife are busy uh, buying shells, calabash, and coral. There's a coral there, I think, not uh, pointed. Anyway, there is a coral which was probably purchased in the 1750s. There's, um, here we have in the 1760s endless payments to David Sybil, who was probably the house carpenter or joiner. Only one of them is specified, and it's to a son that might amount to a gratuity David Sybil, 4E Ark. And we cannot, ask and I, cannot think that this refers to anything but. Museum. It's the right date and it's the right man to have made the cabinets, which there is. There's David Sybil for the Ark. And the cabinets themselves give little clues to their date apart from their design, except one of them has a stockist stamp on the clock. Um, and Stevens was a merchant listed in the Dublin inventory, so Sybil may have bought some wood in Dublin at that time. Uh, other interesting thing about the cabinets is the stands for the boxes of specimens. Each box has a slap. Do I mean a slap? No, I mean a slot. A slot. <laughs> <laughs> Behind it. And I, we don't know what they're for, except we think they might have been not putting bats in, and the bats would tell you what was in the box. <laughs> Uh, I suppose we only have 15 seconds for each slide. <laughs> so here are shells bought by Thomas and Lady Betty. And here's one lovely <coughs> hostage egg uh, laid at Dundrall. <laughs> 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 
Crown Brassel is supposed <coughs> to have had a menagerie of diamond chalk, which they presumably visited and were presented with one of them, a new laid egg uh, on the time of their visit. It clearly got broken uh, at some stage in its history, and in 1803 it was mounted in this rather handsome mount by the William Pitts, who is a maker to Rudge, Grindle, Rudge, and Rudge, Rudge, Grindle, and Thomas Cobb's daughter being at the court, uh, lady in waiting to the Princess of Wales at that time, uh, lady of the wood bedchamber, as it were, uh, probably brought that about and they saved the egg and gone. Um, what's this for? Stag's horns, yes. Now, we have some neighbours called Barnwell, who lived in a house called Turvey. Turvey and Newbridge were like that, and Thomas bought quite a lot of the Turvey lands from the Barnwells, who were in deep trouble by the 1760s. They were a cruising family, and they uh, had let, they left the Turvey family for a term long outside his lifetime, the fourth Viscount. Um, and he was declared a bankrupt later on. But we find Thomas Cobb paying his gardener's wages and paying his cook's wages. And at that, just about this time, he buys stag's horns for half a guinea, quite a lot of money. And as it was a deer park with galloping deer all around the house of Newbury, uh, they are obviously not just ordinary antlers. And so we imagine them to be uh, these massive fossilized deer hunters, nine foot span. And what's particularly nice about these is that if they are the turvy ones, which we believe them to be, um, they were dug up, we have a record, they were dug up in 1684, and they're referred to in a paper read to the Royal Society by Henry Moat uh, in 1697. In the same paper, he makes this delightful remark that the Duke of Ormond presented a set that had been presented to him, to Charles II, and Charles II ordered them to be hung in a horn, the Horn Gallery at Hampton Court, whereupon all the other specimens lost something of that. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas Cott also was clearly interested in the Cook Voyages. The only book purchase in all his accounts which mentions the title is this entry here, Cook's Voyages, three volumes, five pounds, 18 shillings. This is the uh, 1784, this is February 1785, the 1784 edition of Cook's third voyage. Now, we've discovered this extraordinarily interesting thing that James Cook's surgeon on his second voyage was an Irishman called James Patton who retired and married one of Thomas Cobb's tenants' daughters, um, and whose brother was the family doctor over a period of 23 years. So we believe that accounts for various South Seas, curiosities like this, I think it's called the Tuarua headrest, and Tapa inscribed from Mrs. Cobb, which is his daughter-in-law, and, and um, so we have this very nice Cook connection, mm -hmm. Cook voyage connection, I should say. And one of the things that was most enjoyable for the book was this Oliva specimen, which puzzled the conchologists because it's, it would be a unique species if there's no other like it. Uh, so unique is it. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy Way, the oncologist who was cataloged in Britain, suspected that there was man intervention. <laughs> <laughs> and Arthur's written up, and no, she has written this up very beautifully in the book. And um, the, some very good historian of Shell said, Ah, he said, yes, I know these. They always occur in old collections, and they come from the New Hebrides, where they had invented a method of putting spots on the shells <laughs> by heating up a nail, obviously post-European uh, visiting. A red-hot nail does it. 
So the experiment, <laughs> so the ethnographers have all said, this is nonsense, we've never heard of this at all. And um, so an experiment was done in the Natural History Museum with an electron microscope, no less, to see whether the spots had any interference shown, and it did. There was a layer missing. So the white spot areas had a missing layer, and the natural white inside the shell had the layer that was missing in the spots. And then they actually did an experiment with a red hot nail and produced beautiful spots on the other <laughs> which I would have put in there, I'm not getting too many slides. So given that this, although we have a Pacific material from a later expedition, from the Challenger of the 1870s, this case clearly predates, this uh, tray clearly predates that. And uh, so it's probably, again, another little Cook voyage specimen. Uh, and there is Cook's arrival on the new heredity. And of course, they're all wearing the shells. I think our shell is somewhere here. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas Cobb also collected wax wafers. And although there's been a tendency to put everything to the 19th century wherever possible because it's easier that way, um, the, um, he clearly spent quite a large sum of money on wax wafers in 1791. And these, which are slightly different to the other specimens which you will sure to see, I think might be his. And, ah, we now come to a friend of Thomas Cole, who ha had the distinction of being Commander-in-Chief of the Bengali Army, mm -hmm. Colonel Champion, and he made a fair fortune. And he was a godfather, a great friend of Thomas, godfather of Thomas's grandson, and when he died, his wife, Frances, adopted a daughter of another friend of his, who then married another grandson of God. So, terrific involvement between the champions and the cops, and uh, quite a lot of uh, wealth was distributed to the cops from the champions. Um, and from them come these wonderful Norsha the Bad School, mm -hmm. mid 18th century miniature paintings. And probably this lovely puzzle board, mm. which I've looked inside and I've counted 15 concentric spheres. Mm. Mm. Thomas Cobb's nephew, uh, Francis Hastings, um, also, we think, contributed to the museum because he was in the American War of Independence. And this case of stuffed birds are all carried North Carolina, North Carolina. Um, and the mounting could be from the late 18th century. And here is uh, his interest in birds is documented by Gould, mainly a pheasant species in the birds. He later became a, a governor general, well, viceroy of India, technically. Uh, very advocated with Constantine Cotton. Um, and good deadly name of feather species after him. So we now come to Thomas Cobb's grandson. His son predeceased him, leaving ten thousand pounds of debt, so he didn't contribute very much to the museum starting there, so his wife made that. So the son, the foster daughter of Francis and Colonel Champion, Charles and Francis, and his three brothers all collectors, all, all four of collectors. Reverend Henry William Bachelor uh, maintained a room in his cousin's house in Paris, the Grenards. Uh, Colonel Thomas Alexander, who went to India, and Captain William Parr, who served in the Navy under William Beresford. Um, they contributed a huge amount to the next phase of the museum. And Charles continued with his grandfather uh, or his own collecting of wax wafers. I don't know whether you're familiar with these things. They were produced to, so you could stick them on the back of an envelope of a letter uh, instead of having to go through the messy business of putting a seal on. And they're uh, very beautiful, you can't really see in this, uh, but they're incredible detail. And Diana Scarsbrook has identified every single subject and every single one. Um, and he obviously was buying them as well. Um, they also organized the display of items in the museum in trays. And you see the trays were made, some of the trays were made out of 
uh, Isaac J's packs of cards. That's uh, called the Old Frizzle Ace. And it was in uh, it was in use for a certain specific period of time. I've forgotten what it is, so, uh, between 18, 12, and 13, something like that, when the duty changed and everything changed. And there's a um, mutilated card from the same maker, uh, Thomas Kresik. Um, there is an Abraham's oak acorn placed in a tray with a jack on the back. <laughs> and some bits of Egyptian things, indeed rather beautiful, embossed uh, trays. There's another one with little bits of quartz glass. And obligingly has a maker's name, Dodds, London. And somebody's even written an article about embossment of paper, which mentions in detail the history of Dobbs. <laughs> and so we know from the form of the name exactly what date to put on this train. Um, there's a piece of, piece of form. In another form, uh, I decorated tray with pink, uh, pink, pink, pink edges <laughs> around it. And these, I couldn't find the one I wanted, which is a photograph of a tray with several eggs all found in the same nest. <laughs> we now come to Thomas Alexander, the brother who I mentioned as the god son of Colonel Chaplin. And he went to India, he was from the India Company. And in uh, 1809, he married an Indian leader, much to the disgruntlement of his brothers. Uh, and it was a very happy marriage. He had ten children, and um, all those ten children were better all down than any other members of the god family. <laughs> and found good husbands, whereas the only daughter among the other cousins found their husband. Um, there we are. And he, coming <coughs> back, decided to come back to England after a good career, a great career in India, which was considerably helped by his cousin becoming vice um, <laughs> And He came home, and his brother at home in Ireland got a letter to say he was arriving at. Southampton at such and such a date. Well, of course, it took six months for the letter to get there, and he realized he was going to be arriving in a week's time. So he quickly he had 10 children at school in Paris and various establishments in England. So he had a house in Royal Crescent Path, which happened to be the house that the champions had lived in, um, and gathered the whole family there, and then went to meet the boat to find that sadly his brother had died of a, a, a fit while playing chess on board the boat. And he found a perplexed freedom. And one of the sons of the, not the Raja of Moshe, but uh, something else, another title of Nazar or whatever, who wasn't clear why he'd been brought back to England. But, uh, and then the boat was completely packed up with uh, Indian artifacts and specimens and bird skins and ivory furniture. And this catalogue is a two day sale, I think. Uh, yes, May the 14th, and Friday, May the 18th. Uh, the whole lot, the parkings and things that were reserved were sound, sadly, but rather didn't see fit to extend the museum to be found with more than that. And um, some of the items he's marked reserved for his son, and they were also brought in, and they're still in the museum. Um, some who obviously had before the sale the place that he preserved his, before the presiding of Christmas. <coughs> and there's one of the items that went into the sale that was taken out again, um, a rather nice alabaster hookah with its um, um, snake. And we also have in the museum a rare thing which I know from the cloud reserves, where we have the hookah nut that goes with it. Yeah. Hookah is no good unless you have the nut. Mm. Um, it's a lovely ivory state barge. And a series of gods and deities that he commissioned to be made of Minoch, which he bequeathed to his niece. And there's one of his younger children, painted by uh, an artist much in evidence in India, uh, W. F. Hutchison. Um, we have clothes very similar. I don't think they're quite the same, but very similar clothes survive in the museum. This is my great grandfather. 
another brother, then a son of Charles, sorry, not another brother, another child of Charles William, was apprenticed to William Gravett, who worked with Brunel on the Bristol Exeter Railway. <coughs> and in the course of works in that, he sent things home for the museum, uh, a lump of lias, mountain lias in the tunnel, that they were digging some Constantine Roman coins that were found during the digging. And the best thing of all, we can't encapsulate uh, in a picture, but he, in one of his letters, he describes being pulled on a pulley in a basket over a rope stretched over the proposed sighting of the great bridge over the uh, Severn that Brunel was designed, came to design. And uh, the, the, the rope was one and a half inches in diameter, <laughs> 800 feet in diameter. <laughs> We found it a rather thrilling experience. <laughs> <laughs> um, a late adult profession is William's elder brother, Thomas, who looks a bit grisly here. This is my, uh, this is my great grandfather, another great grandfather. Um, and he made a rather unexpected addition to the museum. He travelled in Germany during the 1830s, and one letter. It's quite funny, actually. When I was four or five, <laughs> when I was four or five, my brother was six and seven, uh, we found in a shelf, in a, in a sort of unused room, <laughs> we found a lot of music room manuscripts which we found very attractive, uh, and which we dumped over with coloured water paints. I've still got it. <laughs> My brother later went on to become the music librarian of the British <laughs> Library. <laughs> I know I found the sort of musical collection that And I had it in my mind to produce a postcard of a music manuscript uh, decorated by you in Attic Cops. <laughs> but when I actually came across, I made the searches and letters in England, I came across this letter from this man as a young man travelling in Germany, saying, I, I think I'm going to be able to buy some Beethoven manuscripts in, 19, in 1838, so five years after Beethoven's death. I thought, oh my God. And I went rushing back to Ireland and rooted around to find that we'd only decorated 18th century pin trunks. <laughs> but uh, Thomas made a rather interesting <coughs> thing in the museum. Uh, this uh, wax relief is sort of doesn't look that competent, particularly and if you don't know what it is. But of course, it's a wax model for a lithophane. Well, I'm sure everybody <coughs> knows what a lithophane is. And it's, if you hold it up to the light, of course, all becomes clear. Uh, it's a rather amazing thing. Um, oh, there. Oh, there. Oh, there. This is actually produced as part of the production of making a porcelain lithophane. God knows how we're going to get over it, because it's something only the factory would have. Mm -hmm. So maybe he went to the factory. His sister was the redoubtable Francis Parkhoff of Women's Right, Women's Liberations, anti vivisection first person to speak in favour of university education to advocate university education for women in the 1860s and has been extensively written about. And she made one or two small contributions to the museum, like one with a mummified ear of a bull uh, <laughs> with a lovely label, Ear of Apples, bought in Cairo for Louisa. <laughs> you know Louisa was pleased. <laughs> uh, my own addition to the reason I thought I was allowed to make one or two mm -hmm. is not a Mozart's care and Beethoven's spectacles. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs>